Across all of the continents of Earth, archaeological evidence for the creation of fish hooks have been observed. In Australia, the Arabian Gulf, North America, New Zealand, and many of the Pacific Island nations, shell hooks in completed or broken forms have been found as evidence of the ancient art of line fishing. In the archaeological record, shells in different stages of reduction have been discovered alongside stone files. These stone files are a pivotal tool in shell fish hook creation. In this experiment, two morphologies of hook will be examined. Most Australian sites have unearthed hooks which can be described as strongly incurved. However, there have been findings in the Oman and in the southeast of Australia of a more slender type. This experiment will examine whether one morphology of shell is more efficient than the other. It should also be noted that composite fishhook styles have also been discovered, but they will not be examined in this experiment. Additionally, in southeast Queensland, where I will base this experimentation, ancient peoples living on the coast would have had access not only to shells from saltwater locations such as oceans, but also freshwater locations such as rivers or streams or lakes. Whether this difference is important will also be examined. After discovering the two different morphologies, I wondered why highly incurved fish hooks were found more frequently in the archaeological record. Was it because they were easier to make, or because they are stronger than their slender counterpart? Additionally, I thought it would be important to put myself into the mind of an ancient Australian. If I was living on the southeast Queensland coast, what would I have available to me, and how far would I have to go to get it? Most shell middens seem to contain saltwater shells. However, most shell middens were found near the salt water. I wondered, could fishing have been a common practice further inland, just currently undiscovered? The method of the experiment focused on the two shell types and morphologies. Using a burin, I would create an initial puncture, followed by filing using a stone, I would create my desired shape. I began with the shell labelled L, belonging to a freshwater mussel. This shell was one of the easiest to complete, the shell itself being reasonably flat and the thinness making it easier to penetrate through the shell. Here I realised that after the hole had been created, that that was the ideal time to start filing down some of the areas of the shell in order to make it easier to cut through with the burin later on. Eventually the middle part popped out and I started to smooth it with the stone file. In this particular case, one of the ends accidentally snapped off, so this freshwater shell had to be shaped towards the more slender type. Saltwater shell H was already, luckily for me, in a similarly slender shape to what I needed, so I simply worked the point and slightly altered the overall shape to better achieve the slender curve. This shell, saltwater shell A, was by far the hardest to complete. Not only was the shell thick, but the in-curve shape was a lot harder to achieve than the previous slender shape. After the initial hole had been created, it became imperative to utilise the stone file in this case, whereas in the freshwater shell, it was simply a convenience. This shell took days longer than any of the others and the incredible curve downwards at the end was not exactly what I wanted to achieve. Similar to the last shell, the in-curve shape on this freshwater shell K was very hard to achieve. It involves a lot more filing of the thicker parts of the shell and a single crack can destroy the entire hook. Due to the rather specific shape of the in-curved hooks, I found it necessary on both this shell and the last to sketch out the rough shape I was trying to achieve.
Unfortunately for me, this shell cracked in half during the reduction process. However, I was able to re-sketch out a new shape and create the in-curve shape in a smaller size than I had originally intended. In order to test the efficiency of the fish hooks, it is important to understand how big a fish the hooks could actually capture. To test this, we did a weight test to do the destruction of the hook. It seems clear from the results of this experiment that the freshwater shells were the most efficient. Not only did they take less effort to create, but they were able to withstand the notching process and hold a substantial weight. It is also possible to deduce that the in-curve shape provided a better morphology for tensile force resistance and would therefore be more efficient than the slender type. This shell is the result of the first weight test. Not only is it snapped in half, but the location of the break seems unrelated to the notches previously drawn. This shell, however, resulting from the second weight test, snapped clean off the top, right where the notches had been created to attach the fishing wire. It is also evident throughout this experiment that the skill level of the shell hook manufacturer plays a major part. With both the slender and in-curve shapes, I was not able to achieve the exact shape I wanted and therefore had to create notches on the hooks to attach the weight. These notches would definitely have played a part in weakening the hooks and therefore created inaccurate results. Additionally, in the notching and hanging process, both the saltwater hooks broke and were unable to be weight tested. This meant a true comparison between fresh and saltwater shells could not be established. For future experiments, it would be easier to just focus on either morph morphology or shell origin. The process of creating the shell hooks is incredibly difficult, and therefore simply creating one of each type perfectly would still be a time-consuming process. In this case, many shells once cracked could not simply be thrown aside, but had to be reworked to a possibly less than ideal shape. Additionally, it would be beneficial to the results to document the time taken to create a hook from start to finish. In this case, the amount of times that a hook broke and was reworked, but not completely restarted, tarnished any times that had been recorded. Limitations to this experiment came in the form of the experience of the fishhook manufacturer and the time taken to manufacture it. The materials that I used, it would have been beneficial to have more freshwater shells, because the amount of times that I broke them, and the equipment. It would have been better to use a measure of force instead of simply a weight measure. Fish hooks have played a vital part in the past of ancient Australians. By achieving an understanding of how and why they created and used their tools, we can better understand the circumstances in which they lived.